The Gods of Egypt, Part 2. Thousands and thousands of years ago in the re-emergence of the prehistoric bombardment, ancient survivors sought to establish a society that they were told had once existed. Hard they tried to explain what went before. The golden age that they had never saw, but generation after generation they remembered. And when the re-emergence happened, they remembered again. What to do they knew and the memory of the past was shared in the epic storytelling of remembrance. They were told how the god once shone brightest before other gods manifested and waged war in the sky. These people watched as it plays out in the celestial abode, as it affected their world, as it obliterated their surroundings. When the planets in the solar system exchanged plasmatic displays, when something happened to the unmoved mover, the catalyst of the cataclysm, the epic way of remembrance is in the stories of the gods of antiquity. Wait till you hear this. Yes, the stories of the gods are all over the world are actually events having played out in the sky. This is part two in our Gods of Egypt series, of which we will link part one in the description and narrated by the Russian guy. Seth, for example, was the god of chaos, violence, deserts, and storms. In the Osiris myth, he is the murderer of Osiris in some versions of the myth. He tricks Osiris into laying down in a coffin and then seals it shut, which has eerie echoes of a space age hibernation chamber. Seth's appearance poses a problem for Egyptologists. He is often depicted as an animal or as a human with a head of an animal, but they can't figure out what animal he's supposed to be. He usually has a long snout and long ears that are square at the tips. In his fully animal form, he has a thin dog-like body and a straight tail with a tuft on the end. Many scholars now believe that no such animal ever existed, and the Seth animal is some sort of mythical composite. When he attacks Osiris, the unmoved mover, some have suggested that this is the equivalent of a comet striking the sun that shone over the Golden Age. It's a sudden attack, apparently without warning, and Isis and Horus exist only after this happens. Isis puts Osiris back together. This could be the vision of a gravitational regrouping of mass in space the birth of Saturn's rings, or even the destruction of the asteroid belt. The plasma becomes exchanged with Venus. This is Isis and the birth of Horus in the Osiris myth may be referring to plasma exchanging on Mars. So now we have Saturn, possibly Venus and Mars exchanging plasma. This formed the squatter man in the sky, the Taurus field. The great god from this point is flanked by the two. Isis and Horus are the two. As the event manifests over millennia, other gods in the manifestation are seemingly perceived to exist and to some cults it was Ptah who was the head of a triad of gods worshipped at Memphis. The other two members of the triad were Ptah's wife, the lion-headed goddess Sekhmet, and the god Nefertim, who may have been the couple's son. When gods walk with men, or if men visit the gods' abode, it is unknown if the stories of the gods are used as remembrance and then for control, or if the religious control over a population happened naturally. The first king was the enlightened one of God. How the selection becomes identifiable to a global population is unclear, but priests emerge from the priest, selections are made, a royal bloodline, but what is special about the royalty of these kings and queens, and why do they own this right to rule? Ptah's original association seems to have been to inspire craftsmen and builders. The fourth dynasty architect Imenhotep was deified after his death as a son of Ptah, and scholars have suggested that the Greek word adiptos, the source of the name Egypt, may have started as a corruption of Huit. Kapata, the name of one of Ptah's shrines. And when it becomes impossible to identify the great god of the Golden Age, 
one should remember that the great god shone brightest. Osiris is the same god of Ra, except Osiris is the great god already in the catastrophe and it's Ra whom once shone brightest in the sky before the cataclysm was triggered by whatever Seth represents. The sun god of the golden epic, the god Ra was usually represented with a human body and the head of a hawk. It was believed that he sailed across the sky in a boat each day and then made a passage through the underworld each night, during which he would have to defeat the snake god Apophis in order to rise again. It's interesting to note that the asteroid due in 2029 and in 2036 has been labeled with this doomsday name. Are they telling us the sun won't be visible when the Apophis asteroid makes an appearance? Because that is what the myth entails in detail. Ray's cult was centered in Heliopolis, now a suburb of Cairo. Over time, Ra came to be synchronized with other sun deities, especially Amon. The goddess Hathar was usually depicted as a cow, as a woman with the head of a cow, or as a woman with cow's ears. Hathar embodied motherhood and fertility, and it was believed that she protected women in childbirth. She also had an important funerary aspect, being known as the Lady of the West. In some traditions, she would welcome the setting sun every night. Living people hoped to be welcomed into the afterlife in the same way. She was originally a personification of the Milky Way galaxy, which was considered to be the milk that flowed from the udders of a heavenly cow. As the cataclysm originally begins to manifest, this may be one of the original stories brought forward. In the epic Ra, in his declining years, sends his daughter Hathar as the weapon that he used for punishing the sinful mortal people on Earth, the beginning of the plasmatic bombardment. It is said that Ra gathered all the gods and goddesses in the hidden place where he holds his meetings and told Nun, the primeval, that he would punish the mortal people because of their negligence for him and disrespect for his instructions. But he would not do that until Nun determines the means of torturing them. Nun suggests that he can send his daughter Hathar in the form of a lioness to destroy mankind as a kind of revenge from those who ridiculed the sun god and annoyed him. Ra agreed on this idea and ordered his daughter to take the form of Sekhmet, a savage lioness, and shed the blood of the mortal men who does not respect Ra anymore because he grew old and weak. She obeyed the command and covered the earth with the blood of her praise and spread terror among the inhabitants of the earth. After a while, Ra felt that he is satisfied with what happened and he does not want to destroy all the mankind. Thus he commanded his daughter to stop killing, but she disobeyed him because she became bloodthirst who finds her pleasure in torturing mortal beings. Ra was very angry because he is not able to force his daughter to follow his order and he tried to find any means for stopping her. Ra, accompanied by the other gods, tried to trick her by using a huge amount of the plant of mandrake. A red plant grows in Elephantine Island in Aswan. To use it in making a wine, it has the appearance of blood and the impact of narcotics to help her to relax and sleep. This was the manifestation as it was remembered when planets were the gods when manifestations occurred taking place in the sky and directly influencing the inhabitants here on Earth. But what do you guys think about this anyway? Comments below and as always, thank you for watching. The ancient civilizations of the Earth have remained silent for millennia, but they left a message for us to find. The astronomical clock at Giza, the curious remains of Puma Punku, and the true age of humankind emerging in the timeline of the findings at Gobekli Tepe. These remains are dating back to a time in history that is before any known technological breakthroughs. Yet, they are beyond current understanding as to how they were built, by whom and why, or what they even are. The Great Pyramid of Giza was built to such an over-engineered degree that it has seriously grasped the attention as to how it was built and what machines may have been available to a lost civilization who would construct something so complex that we couldn't replicate it today. Yet, the Great Pyramid of Giza was built to perfection 
as the biggest, most unbelievably complex megalithic structure in this region at the first attempt and progressed, then regressed. It is almost inconceivable that a 4.5 billion year old planet only reached its pinnacle within the last 5,000 years. And perhaps these structures are telling us something about cycles and patterns that may have predestined the fate of the people who built them and what that means for us. We are the descendants of a lost civilization. They were the ones who sought to build megalithic structures on the earth with stone that could not be moved and would not weather. So they would reach through the ages to tell us something very important for humanity. Their message points to the stars and is being deciphered in modern times. Armed with this understanding, the Lost History Channel is determined to help recover the history of our kind that was lost for so long what it all means, and what it is telling us about our future. We invite you to subscribe. Your journey starts here. Wait till you hear this.